Morning Sparks fans, and it's uh, a bright and early one for me. I'm out uh, earlier than I would ordinarily be, but that's because I don't have to wait for Nigel to turn up because it is still locked down, and I'm back out on the van today. It's another deserted site, and uh, yes, that is permitted by government guidelines, so no more comments, please, about how I shouldn't be out and about. Thank you very much. And um, I wasn't going to film this one, uh, cause I've been here a couple of days, uh, but there's something interesting here today. We're going to try and find a fault, indeed. Uh, and uh, let me show you where I am. I'm in this place, which is exciting, isn't it? Who doesn't like a 60s block of flats? I mean, this is a, an interesting 60s block of flats, as I will now show you. As far as I'm concerned, this is the interesting bit. Foire. Look at all that. This is obviously the meter room. We've got a mixture here, look at that uh, old school time clock going on there. Love that. That's not the bit that I was going to show you. Let's go up. Now this is the interesting bit. Uh, apparently this is the spot where the first lawn tennis ground was opened and where the name of lawn tennis originated. So for any Wimbledon fans out there, this is perhaps holy ground. And now a tower block stands on top of it. Oh well. It's a funny old game. Or is that football? I can never remember. But first, the coffee and a bit of a background tale to this place. What we have here is a two bedroom flat. And I came here last week of Christmas, um, end of December, to talk to them about a refurbished job, which at the time they said was urgent. So I was starting it in January. It's a back to plaster refurbishment. We want new accessories in, etc. Anyway, uh, I won the job, won the quote. Uh, but then they came back saying that there had been a delay. Uh, and by the time the delay had passed and they were ready for me to start, I no longer had the availability. They came back to me saying, can we, can we start on this date? And I was like, well, I can't now because I've got another work now. I'm doing something else. So they appointed someone else, an old boy. For whatever reason, however, they fell out with him. Uh, or no longer, maybe falling out is too strong a term, they would lost confidence for whatever reason. They called me a couple of weeks ago and asked if I would be able to come and take over. Which, I must admit, I was reluctant to do. Who wants to take on another Sparks half-finished job? It's not the usual thing I would do. But the situation with all this COVID stuff being what it is, and this being an empty site and one that I can crack on with on my own, and having previously seen the site and knowing as well that the Sparky had already done the worst part of it, the area is far furthest away from the consumer unit, I figured, okay, let's take it on, take a look. I came first of all and had a look at the, what was in, a brief glance and said to them, look, you sure you want, want to kick this guy off? It doesn't look terrible to me at first glance. And they said, no, no, we, we, we can't be dealing with him anymore. Can you come and finish off? So here I am. And there's some interesting things here, and there's a fault here that we're going to try and fix today using science and mathematics. So this is the room that I've done. Uh, I only had one room to wholly do. The other guy had already done the rest of it, and as you can see, capped cables, prescribed zones, sunk sockets. No biggie there, nothing terribly exciting. However, when I came to have a look at what our man had already done. I found that he'd put in, or was putting in two ring circuits. He'd already put one in, and he was in the, in the business of putting in a second one, the second one serving the two bedrooms. Do you need a 32 amp ring circuit to serve two bedrooms? Anyway, if, if it had been me, and the way I was planning on doing the job, you've got your boards there, two boards, peak and off peak, because they've got storage heaters for the off peak. I've got to sort out all this mess today as well. I'd have come into the kitchen, I'd have run around the high level sockets and I don't know, maybe, I can't remember what I scoped for now. Either I would have left that as one circuit or I would have extended it then through into the lounge area and brought it around to the low level sockets snaking around the room here. More on this hole in a minute. Yeah, nothing terribly controversial is this is all new boarding and plastering that's gone up. So, you know, it would, it would have been a fairly logical run. I'd have just gone around the kitchen, around the living room. He hasn't. And this is, this is interesting, because you tell me why, why this is. Okay, see if you can make sense of this. So it comes from the board, 
to this point. And you think, okay, it goes there next. No, 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 it goes from here across to this point in the middle here. Doesn't go there next, it goes over to here, far corner of the living room. From here, it goes not to there, but to there. Then it goes to the end socket. Then it comes all the way back to this socket. And then it goes all the way around to this one, then this one, then it goes from there back into the kitchen to this one. Then it crosses the kitchen again to that one. And then it goes back to the board. Yeah. There must have been method in his madness, but um, wow, eh? So this is why I've got all these, um, these connectors on because it took me a while just to go around tracing everything out to find what the actual root of this circuit was. That's a bit mad. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I don't get it. I, I don't get why you wouldn't go sort of from there to there to there to there, etc. And again, goodness knows how he's got past that recess where the fireplace was. But no, it's it's weird. It, the kitchen goes to that one first. Like I say, habit gets from that one to that one next, and bypassing this one altogether to the end one, then back to here and off to here. It's, it's all mad. It's mad. It's, it's balmy. Balmy it is. Anyway, the ring circuit checks out. One thing I don't like about it is notice how the cables are all going down. And that's because the homeowner sent me a picture and you can see from the picture that the capping is all below the sockets. I would have run the cables in line with the sockets as I showed in the bedroom earlier. If you're outside the sockets, obviously you're, you're taking them outside the prescribed zone. They're no longer in a horizontal line with the accessories. So when people come to screw stuff on later on, how do they know where the cable is? Their assumption is that the cable is going to be in line with the accessory, but it's not. It's, it's down here somewhere. Uh, and again, I don't get it. This is a guy who's been in like business for 40 years or something. And that's, you know, you find that you, you get all this stuff online about, oh yeah, these, um, these new kids coming in today, they haven't got a clue. Some of the old boys, they've got some weird ways and they're set in their ways and they, they don't change. And you, you argue with them, they're like, oh, I've been doing this for 40 years. So you've been putting stuff outside of zones for 40 years. Well, fucking well done you. Here's another example, kitchen here. All the cables, I put this capping up yesterday. All the cables come in there in a very scrappy manner. And then they exit out here. But where do they go to get to these accessories in this wall? There's nothing, nothing in line with that on that wall to denote a prescribed zone. Yet you've got... Same with the, the cooker hood point up there. How does that cable run down that wall? And this is the problem. If you're taking on someone else's work, how are you supposed to know what goes where? And th this is what I don't like about it. So when I do the certificate for this, I'm going to have to be very clear on the certificate that I'm certificating my work, which will be listed out, under uh, deviations from wiring regulations. I will have to say that another party has installed cables outside of zones, and I don't know where the cables are because it's all been plastered over. And I'll have to make, make it very clear what's my work and what isn't, so that I'm not held responsible in the future for someone else's cock up because the only other option is to rip it all out and start again but look they've plastered these walls and again let's move on to the plastering what they've done is they've put this fibre board onto the walls which is horrible crumbly stuff so that's on the walls and then on top of that is a mesh plastic mesh which isn't bonded to the wall <laughs> isn't bonded to this stuff look it's all, it's all fucking loose and then they've got a plaster layer on top look, look at it It's flaking off. There's the capping below the socket level. The reason this is busted out is because they also cut off the the TV aerial. Now I know the new owners, they, they're not interested in a TV service. So they just chopped that off and left it. And the trouble is it feeds the flats downstairs as well, it daisy chains down. So the TV engineer turned up the other day and said, I've got to find where your TV service is. And I was like, well, you know, I don't think I've seen one here. He says, oh, I'll be in that corner just plastered over it and they probably cut it off. So we boshed a dirty great hole in the wall. Sure enough, cable's cut there, so he's had to reconnect it. Another thing as well, look how recessed these are into the wall. And this is like a, a wooden fibre 
fiberboard. I don't know what its flame retardant properties are like, but deeper boxes have got to go in here to, to bring that out because that, that doesn't look good to me. So it's a really strange installation with really strange materials. And these walls have all been done. And again, why has why all the decorative stuff been put in? Because it, the first fix hasn't finished. So I'm having to work around walls in certain rooms, like the bedroom here, where this new, this, five, this horrible board's gone on, the plaster's gone on. You try and cut a socket in, like I've done down here yesterday, and it all just falls off because this, this stuff's just not stuck on. What can you do? Anyway, let's get on to something interesting. Our fault. We're going to do a, an experiment today, a scientific experiment, no less, to see if mathematics really works or if it is, as I always suspected in my school days, a crock of shit. Anyway, uh, take a look at this. What we have here is quite an interesting thing and again, a bit weird. This wasn't on the scope of works when I provided my estimate. This is, must be something they asked for afterwards. This single outlet here, this single gang outlet, has two cables going to it. One is going back, or will be going back to the off-peak board, and then the other one goes off to this position over here. You can see there's a dual box there, and that's where the storage heater is going to go. So you're going to have a peak feed, which goes back to the main board, and an off-peak feed, which goes to the off-peak board. But it goes via this point here. Why on earth is that, you might well ask. Well, because they want a single socket outlet here on the off-peak side. So that's a socket outlet that will only physically switch on and get powered when the off-peak kicks in at, at night, sort of 2 a.m. to 7 a.m., something like that. It depends on what their time clock's set up to. Why on earth would they want that? Well, they say they want to be able to plug in things like laptops and phone chargers overnight. Uh, and charge them at a cheaper rate. Your laptop and your phone, I don't imagine, takes a, take a, a, a lot of juice. So, savings per year doing that, I can't imagine would add up to much. The trouble with this arrangement is if you've got something like a 3 kilowatt storage heater, then that's going to be taking about 13 amps. The circuit's going to be 16 to 20 amps, isn't it? And your storage heater is going to be taking 13, maybe a little bit more than 13 amps. Depends on the size of it. I don't know what the size in the storage heater is for yet. Again, my estimate excluded storage heaters. It uh, included getting supplies to them, but not the heaters themselves. So um, I, I think personally, if they wanted an off-peak socket, it would have been better to run a, a cable back to the board to provide a dedicated socket capable of supplying up to 13 amps so that they could plug whatever they wanted within reason into it. Um, this socket is going to be sharing its supply with the storage heater. The storage heater is going to be gobbling up the majority of the demand that the circuit can supply. So there's not a lot left for this socket. Now, yeah, if you're plugging in phones and laptops, fine, but it just seems a bit strange. However, here's the problem. Here's the issue we've got today. When I was doing my circuit tracing a couple of days ago, I put my clips onto uh, neutral and earth there and performed a resistance test. And look at that, I get 0.14 ohms. I was thinking, why am I getting that? And the other end of that circuit is here. And as you can see, there is no short between CPC and neutral. So why am I getting a resistance reading? Well, there's a fault with the cable. Yes, the cable, which runs from there to there, has a dead short neutral to earth. What a bummer. And this is always, um, this is the reason why you do your dead tests before the other work starts. Uh, you can see I've, I've gone around and I've put connectors on all the, the socket outlets so I can do my continuity tests end to end to my insulation resistance test so I know though the two socket circuits are good but I know this is bad because again I've got the tester on it the question is is this bad because the electrician cocked up installing it or is this bad as a result of someone like the plasterer coming along and 
damaging the cable in some way. If you do your dead tests at the end of first fix, then you know what's good and what's bad, and you can correct anything bad. Not that usually there is anything bad, but you can correct it before anyone else comes along and starts doing decorative works. If you've got something that says, written down that says, here are my test results, they're all good, and then subsequently on second fix you find something that's bad, well, you can go and blame the plasterer then, can't you, or the builder, or whoever else has been on site and has uh, potentially messed up works, because obviously these are supposed to be finished walls here. I mean, they say supposed to be, the finish is rough on them. I don't know what's, what they're going to be doing about finishing the finish. Maybe there's another skin coat to go on top, or maybe they're going to sand it down, I don't know. But, but the trouble is, if all that's in capping and it goes all the way around there, potentially I've got to bust open both these walls. And because it's a horrible fibre for board stuff, and because it's on a loose mesh, and because it's such a thin plaster layer that's not hanging onto the mesh properly, as soon as I start hitting that wall, you can bet the damage is going to be bad. It's going to flake off everywhere. And I've warned the homeowners, I've said, look, there is a faulty cable here. Something's got to be done about it because otherwise it's going to trip the RCD as soon as the storage heater kicks on. So this is it. Obviously, the previous Sparky put that in, never tested it. And he'd have got a call once everything was finished, fitted and furnished to say we've put our storage heater on and the RCD keeps tripping off. So then he'd have been in a world of pain, wouldn't he? Because he'd really be stuck having to try and fix that. At least we're in a position here where it's not the end of the world if we do some damage. But I'm hoping that I can pinpoint where the fault is using a resistance. Okay, kids. So we know we've got a fault on this cable and rather than ripping out the whole wall, I want to know where that fault is or try and get a, a kind of idea of it. This may or may not work, we'll, we'll give it a go. I've put a connector on to line and CPC at this end, line being good. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to whiz the camera around, drop it down. Ugh. Hopefully you can see the tester there. Oh, let's zoom out, shall we? That'd be better, wouldn't it? I wonder why things are so close. Almost had you zoomed right into my balls then. I've put the tester on to line and CPC here, and we're going to take a reading. That reading comes back as 0.08 ohms. Can you see that? 0.08 ohms. So that tells me line to CPC from here to there to back again is 0.08 ohms. Line to CPC, 0.08. If I take my 0.08 and divide it by the figure given in table I1 of the on-site guide for 2.5, 1.5mm cable, which is 19.51 milliohms per metre, so 19.51 uh, times 10 to the minus 3. Incidentally, I write in exponent because of my college days 30 years ago, that's what we were taught to do, but the 10 to the minus 3 just means we move the decimal point because we're converting uh, a reading from ohms and this is giving us a reading in milliohms. We have to do a conversion. So we, I could type it in as 0 0.01951, but I'm used to using the exponent button on my calculator. If it wakes up, 0 0.08 over 19.51 exponent to the minus 3 gives me what should be a cable length of 4.1 meters. Okay, let's do a measurement shall we and see how accurate that is. It will become clear why I'm doing this in a minute, hopefully, unless it doesn't. Getting from that end of the room to here would be Approx 296 centimetres. Now we know that, oh, I don't know how well you can see me here, we know that our cable is just under here and then it passes up so we have to take into account an extra 30 centimetres. And then on this side, we're coming in approximately 83 and up by another 18, give or take. Let's add them up. I'm going to use my calculator. 
<laughs> I know, I, I, my maths is atrocious. 296 plus 30. There's people watching and already know the answer. Did it in their heads. 427 centimetres. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? So, I don't quite know how this cable runs in the wall. I'm assuming it's a straight line across and under. But the what the on-site guide says should be our number of 4.1 metres, based on the resistance measured. And what we roughly, very roughly measured with our tape measure suggests that, yes, that is the expected cable length. So that tells me it's not zigzagging off anywhere else. Uh, it is indeed a straight run across. Very interesting. Now then, now then. We have a cable. End to end, that's what we've got. And we know that it's about, let's split the difference, 420 centimetres long, 4.2 metres. Yeah? Let's now take a reading neutral to CPC on our fault and see what number we get. What number do you reckon we're going to get? That whole lot there was 0.08. So if it's a perfect short, and then that short, if it's halfway along the cable, would read 0.04 from either end, if it's perfect short. Let's see what we get. Obviously if it's less, then it tells me it's on this side of the cable. If it's more, it tells me it's on that side of the cable. 0.13. That's a high number, isn't it, in comparison? So on this side we're getting 0.13. Let's put the tester on the other side and see what we get there. This side we're getting, let's make sure it's nice and tight. 0.16. Hmm. So on that side it's 0.16. Now as I say, if it were a dead short, at the midpoint of the cable, then we would expect to see 0.04 either side. We're seeing a higher number, a higher number than the cable length. So that suggests to me that it's not a dead short. What we're looking for here is perhaps penetration by a screw or uh, a capping nail has caught it or something like that. Something where there, there is a short, there is a resistive short. Uh, this isn't an IR failure, this is a, just a plain resistive short that an ohmmeter will pick up. But there is some resistance within that short that's adding to the numbers. It also suggests to me that it's near the midpoint of the cable because the two numbers are quite similar and it's slightly more towards this end. So when it comes to my two adjoining walls this is the wall to start on. There's no point me starting on, on this end because I'm closer to the short point here than I would be at that end. So what we want to do is we want to find our midpoint. Uh, we want to physically measure something at around, around about the 410 centimetre mark. Sorry, the 210 centimetre mark. I told you my maths was bad. We want to find physically where, where our sort of two, two ten centimetre mark is and then come in a bit on this side to see where we want to open the wall. Good theory, eh? What could go wrong? But we are looking for, I suspect, the cable that has been caught in the capping or a screw has penetrated it or a capping nail has penetrated it or it's been crushed against some kind of uh, metallic structure that was already in the wall, an existing screw or nail head or something like that, something where it's got through the insulation and it's touching the copper but it's not a perfect short. Right, well I'll mark up and then we'll have to get noisy and dusty. Okay, here's our midpoint as roughly measured. That's 180 centimetres in, which is 180 plus 30 gives us our 210 that way. And similarly, we get 210 going the other way. So um, I'm going to open it up somewhere around here. I've had the magnet across here, not picking up anything. I know there's obviously steel capping under here, but the fibre board's too thick for the magnet to get through. But I'm not picking up any screw heads on the outside, so it doesn't seem that the plasterer on the face of it has put any screws in here. I've got a laser line where I think the steel capping is, but obviously I, it wasn't my job, I wasn't here when it was put in, so 
I can't tell for sure. So all I'm going to do here is open up a section. Maybe I'll just open up a little section first of all, try and minimise it. Something around here. How's that dance go? Big box, little box, cardboard fish, whatever it is. Big fish, little big fish, cardboard box. That's it, isn't it? Big, big fish, little fish, cardboard box. I'll open up something around here. And we'll see what we can see. See what surprises lurk within. I shouldn't have to go too much higher in that line because that's where the bottom of the socket is. I'm going to try and keep the cut neat so that it's more easily repairable. And we shall see if any smoking guns lurk within this section here. Right, windows open. I'll put the vacuum on and I'll get PPE'd up. That was noisy. I don't want to cut too deep, obviously, because, well, I know there's cabling behind here. I presume it's under capping still, but I want to find this fault, not add to it. So I'm going to sort of peel this horribleness out and see what lurks behind. Well, there's our capping all right. Obviously, I went down much lower than I needed to. I don't know which capping is which, which contains the cable for the socket circuit and which contains the cable for the storage heater. No smoking gun so far I'm afraid, on the face of it. Certainly the capping's intact, no, no nails to be seen. Something must be holding it to the wall of course, something I haven't seen yet. So I'm going to have to continue excavating further this way. For the moment. Don't have to get down so far though, obviously. And again, I'll take it in sections. I, I'm hoping that I'll hit the problem sooner. I don't want to cut the whole lot out and then find it's just here. So let's, let's start with that one, shall we? And uh, see where that takes us. found a capping nail. Found two capping nails. This is interesting. This is interesting. That could be it. I'm going to take this out to give me some room to work with. But I found here, and I'll show you on the camera in a minute, a capping nail that looks like it may be penetrating into the capping itself.
take a look at this. Now when I put capping on, I don't penetrate the capping itself. I drill and plug a hole usually, unless it's um, a block. I, I drill and plug a hole and then whack a capping nail in so that the nail head covers over the edge of the capping. Like this picture here, of this. here's one I did earlier. And then, you know, there's no chance of it penetrating the capping. But take a look at this, see this nail at the bottom here? That's actually gone into the capping itself. So there's a good chance that this may be our point of problem. What we can try and do is, before we disturb it, we'll put the ohmmeter back on. Then we'll take this nail out and we'll see if it has any effect on the resistance reading. If, our, if removing the nail, if the nail is causing the short, if removing it causes the value to change, then we know that that's definitely it. And then we can open up this capping here, repair the damage. So let's do that. What did we have before? We had on this side 0.13. Oh, well, that's gone up by a lot, hasn't it? Well, that's, that's a positive sign. Let's check it from the other end. Because that may mean that just that we've already disturbed it. In which case, this, uh, there's a good chance that this is it. Yeah, we're getting a similarly high reading at the other end. So we've already disturbed the fault. So we, we must be in the right area. This, it's very likely this nail is it. Let me put that resistance meter back on. So like that, and we're getting 0.41. See if we can't extract this. Did look at that. <laughs> the state of that. Do you expect that from an electrician who's been in the game for decades? Again, I, I drill and plug the wall so you don't get that shit. So fuck knows what path that's taken. Now this may all be incidental but we'll find out. Let's do a test. There we go, look at that, open circuit. That was our fucking fault. Let's, uh, what we're going to have to do now of course is cut open this capping without damaging the cables further inside. So we can get to the busted point, and then we'll have to decide what on earth we're gonna do regarding replacement or repair. Jeez, oh, look at that. Fucking state of it. Hey, there you go, there's your money shot. Look at that. I keep saying that, don't I? Let me zoom in. Bang through the fucker. Yeah? Electrician of fucking 40 years, whatever, has done that. So you can't blame the plasterer. He's put it out of his own. He's made a fucking lash up of putting the cap in. I'm going to take a photo of that for my client. And I've had to reopen the wall. To find this. Now isn't it lucky, well it's not, no it's not lucky, isn't it good that I had the technical mounts to try and narrow down where this was without fucking out both these walls because I could have just started at one end and fucking gone across and although my original position wasn't quite there, come on I'm only 10 centimetres out here so you know I'm sucking the old pink oboe a bit on that one but deservedly so I think. I'm going to send that over to my client now. Uh, and of course now it's my problem to sort this out one way or another. Ideally, obviously I pull in a new cable, but that's not going to happen today. There we go, I've opened her up. And it just goes to show, doesn't it, if you are taking on someone else's work, and again, it's not the kind of thing I'd normally do, if you are taking on someone else's work, always do a full test and inspect as much as you can of the installation before you begin. Don't just assume that because it's new wiring, it's all been done right. Because like I say, this uh, well, this could have potentially bitten me on the arse had this still been in place after everything had been completed. It's, uh, it's good that we're finding it now before all the plastering gets finished. The question is, what the hell am I gonna do about it? 
I mean, ideally, I'd run a new cable, but that's that's not going to happen because of various reasons. Firstly, if I were to run a new cable, I wouldn't be able to get it where I'd want it, i.e. in the prescribed zone, because he's put other obstructions in the way, there are other accessories in the way between these two points that would stop me getting a cable from A to B. It's, it, it is how I would have done it had this been a blank canvas, but it's not, and I'm in a position where uh, it is what it is, as Nigel would say. Uh, secondly, uh, this is my last day on site here. I'm somewhere else tomorrow and then the plasterers are back. Uh, so this is one of the last jobs I've got to do is to, to fix this. But I haven't got the time to remove all this wall and reroute a new cable. So I'm going to have to go for the repair option because the, of the time constraints and the financial constraints as well, the, the homeowner doesn't want me removing any more of this decorative finish, this final finish, if you can call it a final finish, than, than I have to um, because of their own budgetary concerns. So I'm going to have to go for some kind of repair option. And there are various ones that I can select, of course. I'm just going to figure out what's best in this case. Um, we can do some kind of inline splice, uh, crimp, maintenance-free junction, something like that. I'm not a fan of having a junction box in a wall, but it won't be unsafe. Uh, and if it's a maintenance-free option, then that is permitted by this regulation down here. And that, that's one of the things, I mean, you come across customers who call you out because they've knocked a nail through a cable or whatever. Uh, it's not not an uncommon job to have to repair this sort of fault. It's uncommon at first fix like this because you'd, you'd hope that the guy putting it in wouldn't be completely fucking cack-handed in putting in his own nails. Um, but you do get homeowners who move into their property and start hanging up pictures on the walls and manage to smash straight through a cable that's behind the, the wall even though they uh, didn't spot that there was an accessory in line with it. Uh, and of course, in those sort of positions, it's a again, it's a finished property. You, you can't just go replacing the whole cable. You have to put in some kind of solution. You wouldn't put in a screw solution, like a, a screw JB, because the screws can get loose over time. So we're looking at some kind of... Uh, crimp or inline splice, like a splice line solution, or a, a perhaps a Hagen J803, something like that. Something that can sit there and safely do the job and is maintenance free and doesn't need to be uh, looked at again. I've got various solutions on the van, I've just got to figure out which I'm happiest with in this case. But I would never do anything that I wouldn't be prepared to live with myself. So if this were my house, my cable, whatever solution I put in today would be something that I'd think, well, if this had been my house, I'd be happy with that. I'd sleep at night knowing that was there. So whichever way I do it, whether I run a new cable or whether I put in a repair, there will be people who say, oh, you shouldn't have done it like that because everyone's got their own ideas of what is acceptable and what isn't. Um, but I'm not going to be doing anything here that's, that's against regulatory requirements and I'm not going to be doing anything here that I would think, well, I'm not happy with that, I'm glad that's not my house. It's going to be something that will do the job. Uh, and although it's not the perfect solution, the perfect solution being to reroute the cable, of course I'd have to still go around and smash out all the walls to do that. And I'd get just as much grief in the comments from people saying, oh, you complete fucking melt, can't believe you smashed out the wall for that when you could have repaired it. So it's a no-win situation, but, you know, like as I say, different people have different ideas. If you, if you would have approached it differently, uh, do leave a comment, of course. Bear in mind there are financial constraints, there are time constraints. And I've already said that my ideal solution would be to run in a whole new cable. Uh, that's just not really a viable option in this environment today. But, you know, uh, there, are, there are different ways of repair. So let me know um, what your prefer preferred repair methods are in case you've got something that, uh, that I haven't come across, some whizzy dongle or do-wicker that I haven't seen. Always happy to learn from you commenters out there, the polite ones anyway. Isn't it a shame that the Quickwire product is only rated at 1.5mm cable at 16 amp? because wouldn't that have just been ideal just to cut and trim them off, stick them in there, job jobbed in like two minutes flat. Uh, nice low profile solution. I recall at Alex last year talk of them making one of these rated at up to uh, 32 amp for use in this kind of thing where you're junction where you're cutting a socket cable to uh, spur off. 
but uh, I haven't heard anything further about it at the time of recording. However, I shall uh, update this video if I do hear anything before I publish it. Because I have just asked the question on Twitter, because that, that would be ideal. I'm leaning towards the Aga J803 in the wall. Um, I could potentially chop and crimp it. The reason I don't like crimps, crimps with heat shrink, is even with the heat shrink, there's always going to be a little bit of basic insulation still left out outside. Um, a Vargo Connex box or a um, inshore box would be probably too deep, although the inshore might have done it actually. Yeah, the inshore might have done it with some splice line connectors. But um, I've been down to the van and bought about an 803, which I've shown before. Maintenance free push fit connectors, nothing to go loose. Got the cord grips, everything with the basic insulation and life parts are contained. What I would have to do though to fit this is obviously to cut more out here. I'll probably end up squaring off this hole a bit. Uh, I would have to SDS some of the block out the back there so that this can sit flat within there. And then um, that's probably about as good as that's going to get. But like I say, it's not ideal circumstances. I don't know how our man managed to cock up his capping nails because this is this block is soft as shite. <laughs> you know, you, I don't need to drill and plug these nails. They, they'll just go... They're in no trouble at all. So it must have taken some extra fucktarded effort to, to get them as bent as they were. I mean, how how do you get that, that bent in this soft block nonsense? Beggar's belief. Anyway, what I've done is I've chased out a uh, little cubby hole for my J803 to sit in, so that's all terminated there. That can shut up. It should sit flush within the wall, and then I should be able to put a new piece of board over it. And I probably will put the board over it as well, rather than leaving it to a third party like a plasterer or whatever. I'd rather that it were there, and then they come in and, and make good. Otherwise, I'm relying on them to mechanically get something back over here without fucking it up. Uh, and I don't really trust anybody, to be fair. Certainly can't trust this electrician who left this in like this. And, it, and it's not ideal because, again, you've got an unprotected bit of cable here. Not that the capping is there to provide mechanical protection anyway. It's only there to protect against the plasterer. So if I take on the job of putting a board over here, then I've taken that job away from the plasterer. So it should be okay. Doing some tests. And unlike before, insulation resistance now passes. There's my board. I've actually bonded that on because I don't want anybody else taking it off. When the plaster returns, I just want them to stick a layer of plaster over the top of it and not to uh, not to disturb anything behind it. Because if I know no one else has been behind it, then I know that any problems in the future are down to my junction and not someone else's cock up. There you go, 0 0.08 neutral earth. Neutral CPC, we should get the same line CPC, in which case this cable all checks out. I'll have to test the cable that was running alongside it as well, which I have already tested and that, that checked out okay, but because it's been disturbed today, I better make sure that that's not in any worse condition than before I started. But otherwise, that's that. Um, so yeah, I thought that'd be, be fairly interesting, and like I say, I'm going to get some scorn in the comments about the nature of the repair, but that's expected. It doesn't matter what I'd have done. I'd have been berated in the comments. What else have I got to do here today? I've got to tidy up this fucking mess down here, which looks worse than it is. Just need some containment put it up and the cable sorting out. And I've got to do something about it. Again, this, this, this is all new. A spur gone in and a shaver socket's gone in by this other guy. Look at the way those cables are run. And uh, look at that. You'd think that someone who's been in the game that long would know how to use a spirit level. You can see it's physically off. You don't even need a spirit level to see if that's off. So, you know, when you get people banging on about the new blood in the game being terrible, well, some of these old boys are as well. I mean, who can make such a 
hash job of the basics like putting stuff on straight and hammering nails into block walls. Block walls, didn't even need to drill them. Madness, I say, madness. Right, well, I better get on because uh, I want to get done and packed up and home in time for hand jobs. Catch you on the next one.